slide and another slide down below. It's all Texas Medical Center. It's, uh, it's a very busy, busy place. Slide. But when you get between the trees, you start to see places like this, these greenways, these, these corridors of green space. And when you get even closer, you start to see places like this. This is a patient care garden. We, we, um, we uh, as, I, as you'll soon learn, I talk a lot about the restorative value of these gardens. Slide. You also see a lot of places like this. This is going to be the focus of much of our conversation today. This is a prairie restoration site. So a little bit about myself real quick. I am, uh, uh, my current role is the director of operations right here at this very facility in a strange twist of fate. I never, uh, a few weeks ago, I never imagined myself being in this position. I actually left MD Anderson, but I was a facilities project manager there for about seven years. And my background is in horticulture. I went to Texas A&M. And I define myself as a recovering landscaper because I was a landscape company owner for about 15 years before I decided to spread also applies to places like Herman Park or the places that you guys work and do your conservation work at. I'm going to talk about the establishment benefits and challenges of our pocket prairie and those are all, are all kind of blurred together so if you have any specific questions about that as we go feel free to ask okay and then I'm going to talk about the evolution of prairies so as you will find out this pocket prairie that you guys are most of you guys are familiar with was um, was the beginning of a series of events that unfolded and led to bigger and better projects that increased the sustainable footprint of MD Anderson. Slide. Okay, so first of all, um, in order to help you understand the why behind why we have pocket prairies, I want to talk about the role of nature in hospital settings. Slide. So when I, you recall that I was a landscaper, right? So when I sold projects to my clients in the past, I sold prestige and increased property values and um, that it was a, a pretty hollow value proposition there. But when I came to MD Anderson and started to talk to people about what I was doing there, I was often met with tears and hugs and thank yous. And it really caught me off guard at first, but what I soon realized was that gardens at MD Anderson in hospital settings in general elicit very powerful emotional responses from people. So I wanted to learn more. So I uncovered this gentleman, Dr. Roger S. Ulrich. He's a pioneer of what we call evidence-based design. He specialized in healthcare, and he looks primarily at how healthcare systems are designed and how they integrate with the environment. Okay, slide. So you may not be familiar with Dr. Ulrich, but I'm sure everyone in here has heard at least one reference to this groundbreaking study from 1984. He was the first to document the post-operative recovery of hospital patients who underwent the exact same procedure. It was a gallbladder removal procedure. Same doctors, same nurses, same everything. Even the rooms were laid out the same. The only thing that was different was the view that these patients had from the room. One view was of brick walls. The other view was of deciduous trees. So all things being equal, how do you think that their recovery differed from each other? Slide. Well, in the interest of time, I'll tell you, and you can guess where I'm going with this. The, the group that had the view of nature experienced shorter recovery periods, less pain medication, they required less pain medication, they had more positive attitudes, they had fewer complications, and they had less stressing, stress and anxiety. They also had higher patient satisfaction with the healthcare providers. Slide. This, by the way, less stress and anxiety is the number one benefit of nature in hospital settings. But that's also the number one benefit that we get simply from looking at green space. So if I was to open these windows again, within minutes, we would experience a lot of these, um, a lot of these effects here. But the fascinating thing to me is that it's completely involuntary. You, but your body can't help it. Okay. I think we skipped one. Okay, so it turns out that there are a lot uh, there are a lot more benefits besides improved clinical outcomes. We have physical benefits. We have physiological benefits. We have mental health and well mental health and wellness benefits simply from interacting with nature. Slide. So we understood this so well at MD Anderson that we created several programs that we call nature-based interventions that, uh, that we used as a tool to improve quality of life for patients, visitors, staff, and the general public. So here's, here you see an example slide. 
We had a, uh, a garden program which spun off into lots of uh, outreach. We had cooking classes revolving around that slide. Um, have you ever heard of doctors prescribing nature to patients? We had a, a similar program like that. Slide. Okay, we had a meat program that was prairie based with uh, partners, the Katy, uh, Katy Prairie Conservancy and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reaching out to our pediatric groups. So they have started a program called Virtually Wild that is still going on and they stream live content, live nature based content into our children's cancer hospital once a month and they rotate from our national wildlife preserves and prairies around the uh, Houston area. It's really neat. Slide. Okay, and we have a legacy volunteer uh, rose program where roses are pruned and delivered to patients in the hospital, uh, in hospital beds. So nature is very well integrated into the fabric of MD Anderson now. Slide. Okay, so because of this, because of these benefits that we've been talking about and what I just shared with these programs, uh, I believe what Dr. Ulrich says that nature is an undeniable part of our public health infrastructure and that's the same way that I view places like Herman Park. Slide. So the other part of the why, which is very important, and we're, we're kind of setting the stage for the prairies here, is that our health and environmental health are inextricably linked. They are connected. Slide. So one of the benefits of working at MD Anderson is that you get you get uh, first-hand exposure to the research, and you not only that, you get to meet the people doing the research. So, you know, one of the things that I that I did was uh, learn about the the link between chronic exposure to chemicals in our environment with the occurrence of diseases like cancer. Slide. So the. Um, one of the things that I learned about also was that common lawn and garden chemicals that we might use outside at Herman Park or on the grounds at MD Anderson or to maintain a, a pocket prairie are in fact powerful endocrine disruptors, many of which are linked to types of cancer. So here you have uh, from the Environmental Working Group Dirty Dozen Endocrine Disruptor List. Number two is atrazine. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? It's, it's, a, it's a herbicide, but do you know what that is sold as at Home Depot or Lowe's? It's weed and feed fertilizer, so it's, it's nasty stuff. Organophosphate pesticides, uh, powerful endocrine disruptors. Um, infamously, Nazi Germany also used organophosphate class chemicals. They called it nerve gas. It's the same mode of action. Slide. How many of you guys have seen streets like this? I live on one. Slide. So I had this epiphany going from an unsustainable landscape practice to MD Anderson that the average American lawn is actually one of the most toxic environments you can set foot in because of the overuse of chemical pesticides, fertilizers, fungicides. So that little dog there is sitting in that in that perfect green grass but he's probably absorbing all of those chemicals into his bloodstream. So are your kids when they're walking or your grandkids when they're walking barefoot out there. So I, I had this epiphany almost in horror that um, I would never have a picnic in my own lawn. It was, it, it was not a safe environment. Slide. Does it rain here in Houston? Does it? Yes. You know, have we seen a lot of rain lately? Does it flood? Yes. Do we over irrigate? So when that happens, all of those chemicals in our landscapes run off into our watersheds. These red lines are contaminated waterways in Harris County, and as you can see, most of them are contaminated. They are unsafe for contact, uh, recreation, or fish consumption. And the number one contaminant in our waterways is E. coli bacteria. It comes from dog feces. We, this is a hyper-urban county. People have dogs. There are probably more dogs than people. And uh, they walk. Where do, they, where do you walk your dog in a neighborhood? You walk your dogs on the bayous and the detention pond areas, the green space, right? So all of that ends back ends up back in our watershed. Slide. But what else is in there? It's these guys again. So not only are these powerful endocrine disruptors that impact our own health, they are ecological disruptors. Atrazine causes dimor uh, sexual dimorphism in amphibians. They develop both sex hormones, or both sex organs. Uh, in fact, I just read an article about that recently. Organophosphate pesticides linked to uh, the, the, the plight of uh, native bees and, and our imported honeybees. Okay, slide. 
So what is the point? Why did I share all that? Conventional land management practices are damaging not only to our own health, but ecological and environmental health too. So again, we're kind of setting a stage for why we, why we want to build, net, restore natural ecosystems such as prairie. Slide. So this is our why in a nutshell. We want, to, we want our landscapes, whether it's here, there, your place, we want them to promote human health and wellness, all those benefits that we looked at. We want them to promote environmental health. They should serve that dual purpose. And there, there oftentimes can be an economic benefit to it. As, as we'll discuss in a little bit, our prairies have an immediate return on investment by avoiding the cost of, of mowing that, that equivalent area of grass 40 times a year. Slide. So this, by the way, is the model for sustainability. You may have heard this pronounced as people, planet, profit. You know, there's a, a whole different, there's a number of ways to uh, repeat this. But um, the message is that uh, this, is the, this, this has been the driving force behind the decisions that we've made with land management, and our prairies are sustainable. Prairies represent all this. Okay, so let's talk about the establishment, benefits, and challenges of the prairies. Slide. Okay. In order to do that, I want to step back just a little bit. When I when we started uh, restoring prairies at MD Anderson, I knew nothing about prairies. I thought they were just flat pieces of grassland, essentially, uh, low in biodiversity and uh, low in life. And boy, was I wrong. So, um, we, in order to really understand what a prairie was, we had to look back in time. And this is a picture from 1874 in Galveston, Texas. That's Galveston Island. Um, but what do you see? You see ranchers on a prairie. So, you know, if you're not from Texas. You, you, uh, that's okay, but you know you need to know that prairies provided a seemingly infinite uh, rangeland and, and graze for or forage graze uh, or forage for livestock to the point that a lot of species were almost grazed to extinction, like yellow Indian grass, for example. Slide. It was, it was easy to build on a prairie. Three quarters of Houston, if not more, is in the Gulf Coast Prairie ecosystem. Something that I learned is that the Gulf Coast Prairie actually extended all the way up to just below Tomball, where present day Tomball is at now. If you go back to 1943 and look at some of the aerial photography, um, I have to be careful not to call it satellite photography because we didn't have satellites back then. The aerial photography, you'll, you will see the telltale signs of prairie topography still in the Tomball area. Slide. And this is what I'm talking about. This is the uh, topography that you guys, as native plant experts, are very familiar with now. You should be. But this is, a, this is what a prairie looked like. This is a prairie remnant. So those dark patches are depressions, low areas called potholes. Okay. The lighter areas are, are upland areas. And you see those little white stippled patterns? Those are called mima mounds. Those are basically micro sand dunes. I won't get into the, the geology of it much. Uh, it's it's actually quite fascinating if you care to if you care to learn about it more. But basically, that, this is the result of eons of meandering streams across the prairie landscapes. Okay, but what I learned was that a prairie is not completely flat. There is that topography, and that each lowland area and each upland area supports its own unique community of plants and animals. Slide. That's the same area today. Okay. Now look to the right side of the screen and advance the slide. You'll see that spot right there. Raise your hand if you know what that is. Most people in here, right? So what is it? It's the Deer Park Prairie, right? So we went there. I, I wanted to know what a prairie really was. The Deer Park Prairie, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a remnant prairie site. Uh, it's 64 acres, I believe. Less than 1%, I think even less than that, less than one half of 1% of the original Gulf Coast ecosystem remains intact today. So this is one of them. Um, does, do you guys know who found that? Do you know who discovered that land? Don Verser. Don Verser. Okay, so great eye. <laughs> so this land has never been plowed. It has, it has been grazed on, uh, but it's never been cultivated and never been built on. So you have that. You have the uh, the ancient seed bank there, the ancient soil structure. It's all there. So we want to take a look at what a uh, prairie remnant was in person. Slide. And here you go. So I'm a horticulture guy with owning a landscape company, and you know I know it all, right? But I'm walking up to this prairie 100 yards away, immediately I recognize that it's a special place. There's plants that I've never seen before in my entire life. Slide. 
And you know, this is what I saw: a forest of liatris. These were, you know, almost as tall as me, and and going through there, uh, you know, kind of sandy soils. There were orchids growing on the ground, and all sorts of really neat plants. It was amazing. I, it, and to me, it looks intentionally planted. That was what I, something else that I thought was really neat. Slide. There you go. So these big cone flowers, you know, as big as my hand, and you know, it was just a very surreal experience for me. So when I saw all this, this was my, this is, this is, this was the game changer. This is when I knew that we were going to make our pocket prairie. Uh, we were going to pull out all the stops and, and do what we could to make our pocket prairie a success. Slide. And there it is. This is the beginning of it. This is uh, 2012, I believe. Um, this is the site of the former HMB building. It was imploded where that oval track, track is. This prairie patch down here is where the parking lot sat. Have, how many of you guys have been out here before? Not everybody, so some of you guys. So. It's it's accessible. Well, it's open to the public. It's a public space. It's hard to get to though, because um, there's just no parking around. So you could go to one of the TMC parking garages and, and then walk down here. But this is this is shortly. Uh, this is probably a few months after beginning the installation process. Um, it was intentionally designed. So we thought that if we were going to have a tall prairie, we needed to make it blend and fit the site. So having an intentional design is part of the process. So what do I mean by that? We've got um, a very deliberate turf setback. That's a 20-foot strip. We have a border that defines it, and then we have the wild prairie in the middle. And that was important in order for us to uh, make it look like it belonged versus something that was neglected. Okay. Now you can't do that everywhere. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if if you're gonna restore a, a 5,000 acre prairie like Jim Willis with Wildlife Habitat Federation, you don't worry about that stuff. But if it's a pocket prairie in an urban or suburban area, site and it's a demonstration site that you're using to try to sell the benefits of a prairie, pull out you know some extra funding and, and create it intentionally. Hire a landscape architect or a designer to help. Okay, slide. Oh. That is mulch. It's just two feet by six inches mounded mulch. Mm -hmm. That's it. Effective at keeping the, the, uh, the setback Grass, I guess that's San Augustine. So uh, this is zoysia grass. Zoysia. So the you guys will not like this answer here, but the purpose of the mulch is to use herbicide because the the, gra the whatever turf grass you use is is going to invade, and it does. And vice versa, the prairie will come out into the turf grass. So the mulch is a buffer to use a herbicide on, so that it the herbicide will stay in that in theory stay in that mulch strip, but it's also uh, an aesthetic border as well. And herbicide, what, what herbicide? Glyphosate. Glyphosate, yes. Okay. We have also used uh, agricultural uh, grade vinegar, um, and that's. What percentage is that? I, I don't recall offhand. Uh, you can get it from, uh, I think, uh, San Jacinto Environmental Supply and uh, for, through Mike Sorrent okay. or John Ferguson. They, those guys would have the resources for the vinegar. Yep. Slide. Okay, so um, at, at, at this stage in the game, the Deer Park Prairie was not saved. We felt, we, so we saw the need to go there and harvest seeds so that we could preserve those ecotypes and propagate them on our prairie and spread them elsewhere. If you guys need seeds, you, you can come out to the MD Anderson Prairie and collect seeds. So, um, so there is a combination of wild collected seeds. There's a coastal prairie mix as well uh, that was purchased. And we also purchased individual species. Yeah, I did, there is a handout. You guys pick it up before you leave. It's on the table. Um, or you, I see you have it. That is the plant, the original plant list. So one of the things that was, that I learned about that, I should hold on, hold my thought there for a second, but uh, go on to the next slide. So here's the plant list that I'm talking about. I know you can't read it on, up here on the screen, but you have it in your hands. And one of the things that, um, that I thought was interesting was that there are more forb species than grass species, and that's how it was. Um, that's how that was my observation also when I went out to the Deer Park Prairie. I, again, remember I thought a prairie was this completely flat, ubiquitous sea of grass. Okay, slide. So there you go: 28 species of grass, 38 forbs. Slide. 
So this is uh, the first winter. You see a lot of, uh, we, we, we did our initial uh, broadcast seeding in the fall. Uh, we also used um, a uh, cultipacker to press the seeds into the soil. So this was a prepared site, fresh soil. I can, you can, that's, that's a stretch. I can't hardly call it soil. Fresh dirt <laughs> was brought in. It was like, it was like bee horizon soil. There was no organic matter in it. It was laid out over the site. We broadcast the seed by hand. Um, we used the cultipacker to pack it in. It's just a, looks like an aerator kind of that you tow behind a utility vehicle to get that soil seed contact. And a lot of grasses were actually sprigged by hand. Uh, grasses like the uh, eastern gamma grass, uh, which is which likes to live around uh, some of the low-lying areas. We actually sprigged those in the subtle depressions that we have out here. Now, remember, keep in mind that this used to be a, used to be a parking lot, and that will, that will become relevant in a little bit. But uh, the first winter, we saw a lot of germination, a lot of rosettes forming, and uh, you know, it was kind of neat. It's kind of exciting to go out there week by week and, and watch what was coming up. Slide. And by the end of the summer, you know, it was looking like a prairie. If you uh, if you woke up in the middle of that and couldn't see the buildings, you know, it would be hard to tell <laughs> where you were at. And it was neat. So we had a, we had a high rate of. Uh, of uh, grass, prairie grass germination, which is kind of rare. It's been it's been difficult to uh, establish prairie grasses in other areas that we've tried to expand this concept to. Uh, so we we were very fortunate here. Now, I will say that there was temporary irrigation on this site. So if you guys are doing your own pocket prairies and have the opportunity to do temporary irrigation, even if it's PVC pipe above, like on grade on the ground, uh, go ahead and do that because it's well worth the investment in grass gradually you would taper off the irrigation. Right now it's not, it hasn't been irrigated in years other than the natural rainfall. So uh, let's advance to the next slide. And uh, just another, another angle, maybe a slightly different time of year. Late in the summer you can see the Maximilian sunflowers blooming. Slide. And this would be, um, I think this is the second summer if I recall. No, it's not. It's towards the end of that same summer because we have the Monarda, um, the, the horseman blooming. It, it was kind of neat to learn the succession of the plants and what to expect next. And then we have um, those tall ones are the uh, prairie uh, basket flowers. They're really, really tall. They're, they're like six uh, to eight feet tall sometimes. Okay, slide. And this was, so that last slide was late summer. This was uh, early spring where you see the primrose and and uh, I forget what these little yellow guys are. Little yellow guys. Little yellow guys, that's the, the official name. So it's really neat. Okay, slide. So people began to notice, you know, that I think some of you guys might be in this picture. You recognize anyone? Land might be in there. Land. Land. Land's like in all of our pictures. I think that was a wildscape workshop. Um, yeah, okay. So that's uh, Michael Eckenfels in the back. I recognize that. And that's Jaime Gonzalez in the front. Okay, slide. So the public began to take notice, but other people, entities, began to take notice as well. So Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, caught wind of this, and they came out, and they became interested in it. And um, and uh, I, I never saw the episode, but I believe there's a segment, a short segment on their PBS show about prairies, and we might have like a frame or two of that two minutes. But uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was next to uh, become interested in this. They are here in, for, in in force in Houston with their Urban Wildlife Partnership. Let's see, I can't ever get it right. Urban Wildlife Refuge Partnership Program, and their, that, the focus of that program is on pollinator habitats such as prairies, and also connecting with underserved youth in in surrounding communities. So they blend the two together into programs that are nature interventions, the same way that we improve quality of life for patients at MD Anderson. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is doing that with underserved youth in prairies. They're also giving them career paths and options that they never would have been exposed to before, conservation, environmental science. And uh, at the same time, they're creating uh, habitat for pollinators. So I think it's a wonderful program. Slide. So 
by this time, you know, we're we're swimming in our success here with our pilot project, and and uh, you know, we had prairie fever. So we started out with two acres. All of those little prairie cells added up to two acres, and we ended up converting up to I think at one time eight additional acres uh, into prairies. Now, um, here, so here's an example. This was a large area of uh, old world blue stem. This is a highly invasive grass. Um, we did use a herbicide to kill it. Okay, I don't have a better alternative to do that over large um, areas at this point. So we 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 worked with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Wildlife Habitat Federation, the, the Prairie Conservancy, Katy Prairie Conservancy came up came up with the process, and this is how we started to get rid of that old world blue stem. Slide. But this is what we got out of it. It was great, you know. We saw when we did this, we saw something else that we have never seen out there before. Who knows the answer to this? Wetland people. People, that's right. People. They came out on the weekends, on the you know, weekdays taking pictures just like it was these were blue bonnets in the hill country. It was really neat. And um, you know, this first year was the greatest flush I had ever seen in my life. So go on to the next slide there. And it was so bright, it was just so fantastic to look at. You know, I make jokes that you needed sunglasses to go out there and look at the flowers, but it was absolutely stunning. And um, let's see what the next slide brings. I can't remember. This is on our South Campus. South Campus. So remember, uh, from one of those opening slides, MD Anderson has 254 acres in the Houston area. Most of that is in the right here in the medical center, and it's kind of fragmented. You might wander off into another area and be at a, be on campus and not realize it. Um, so that's our South Campus. That's south of OST. It's mostly research facilities out there. We also share buildings with um, UT Health Science. The the dental school is out there. Um, I think uh, the UT, uh, there's some UT housing and the rec center is out there if you're familiar with that section of town. So we're, you know, we're, we're creating all these prairies and converting turf grass into prairies. We're avoiding the costs of mowing. We're having this economic benefit. We're, we're bringing people out of the woodwork to look at the flowers and the succession of plants that are growing. And um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, we had a consistent message about why. Uh, and then we wanted to share the benefits of the urban prairie. And this, this section really began as, a, as an argument or a kind of a defense of our own actions with our leadership because they were asking questions. So, slide. So the first benefit that we talk about is reduced impact maintenance. Okay, so, and I've shared that already. For every square foot of prairie turf grass you plant, that's one less square foot of for every square foot of prairie you plant, that's one less square foot of turf grass that you have to mow or pay somebody to mow. So, you know, we pay a lot of money for landscape maintenance in the medical center. So uh, that's the number one, uh, the most immediate benefit is, the, is cost avoidance. Slide. Okay, so this is an, uh, this is a very important benefit. So the the uh, the group that I operated in uh, site operations, we were responsible for stormwater quality as well, and. When we began this process, we didn't really understand the benefits of prairies and, and native grasses on stormwater filtration and, impro and improving water quality. But when I learned about it, it was like a no whole other light bulb went off. And this this slide right here has actually create uh, led to a lot of other programs that I'm going to share with you in a little bit here. But you know, long story short, you see the inverse relationship between infiltration and runoff from uh, an imperfect surface like concrete you see all that run it's zero in infiltration 100% runoff and it's full of sludge it's dark green because of all the hydrocarbons but look at the prairie grass you have zero runoff and you have a lot of infiltration not all of it infiltrates the rest of that water is held within the surface area of the leaves and the root systems but look at the color of the infiltrated water versus the runoff from the, the roadway it's a lot cleaner a lot clearer this slide Native plant propagation. Uh, th this became one of our battle cries. Again, the Deer Park Prairie was not saved at the time, and uh, we had gone out there and looked around and saw all these alien plants that I have never seen before. This is another one, Oryngium yuccafolium, Rattlesnake Master. Strangest thing I have ever seen. This is my favorite plant now, by the way, so <laughs> I love this thing. Um, so that became part of the, part of the argument. Slide. 
Okay, so I'm going to go off on a little tangent real quick and, and uh, talk to you about why we want native plants. This is just one of many, many arguments, but uh, you know, as, as we lose our remaining green spaces to development, it's up to us to, con to save nature, save these native plants by propagating them ourselves. And Douglas Tallamy taught us that uh, the survival of plant and wildlife species depends on this. Slide. So here's our, uh, our rattlesnake master again with a, a bee on there. I don't know if that's a native or a honey bee. What do you guys think? Native. I'm not a bee. Native bee? Yeah, it looks a little different. Honeybee. Okay. So I learned that this plant supports up to 200 species of invertebrates. Fascinating. How many, how many species does your Japanese ligustrum or azalea, whatever at home, uh, support? You know, maybe one or two pests, but 200 species of insects or in, in invertebrates are dependent on this plant right here. Slide. So what's this? It's a chickadee. What do, what do chickadees eat? Chickadee seed, right? Well, 95% of North American terrestrial songbirds, when they're breeding and uh, you know trying to fledge their chicks from the nest, they don't want bird seed. They want protein. And where's the where does the protein come from? It comes from the larvae of all these insects. Where does that come from? Well, you're, the, these little birds are going to find the larvae on the native plants that they've co-evolved with for thousands, if not you know I don't know how long, how many thousands, tens of thousands of years. So if those if those native plants are not there to provide a food source for the insects, these little guys have to work twice as hard, fly twice as fast, and, and we're put in, end up uh, st in stressed, isolated populations that lead to extinction, localized extinction. And those localized areas of extinction coalesce, and then one day, silent spring. There's no, no native plants, no birds, no bugs, right? So the question is, and you guys know the answer because we're all Douglas Tallamy fans, how many chickadee, or how many insects larva, like caterpillars, does this little chick chickadee need to fledge its its clutch from the nest. Now, keep in mind how small a chickadee is. You know, it might weigh as much as two pennies, three pennies. Um, a, a chick is going to be even lighter. So how many caterpillars does this little guy need? More than two. Let's see what the answer is. Six to ten thousand caterpillars to fledge a single clutch of chickadees. These, these things are tiny. How many caterpillars does it take for a larger bird, like a, I don't know, like mockingbird or robin? Or you know, I'm not a birder, so I don't know all the birds. But that, to me, that was fascinating. Also, it was an alarm. An alarm went off. I thought, wow, you know, it's it's very important to have these native plants in these prairies, and um, so not only did this help us with our prairie argument it helped prop it or it helped it helped us look at the rest of our campus and start to replace plantings with native plants at every opportunity next slide Okay, so here's uh, another benefit, wildlife habitat restoration. Um, I actually call it urban wildlife refuge now, um, taking uh, the lead from the, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, here you see some of our wildlife. It's not, you know, it's not a lion or a tiger or a bear, you know. Uh, most of our wildlife are invertebrates, creepy crawlies. Slide. We have a few mammals out there, a couple rodents, I think, and you know that's not much different from a rodent, is it? <laughs> They're cuter, <laughs> um, you know. But lots of invertebrates, even in the winter time. This is, um, I forgot what plant that is. It might be the the goldenrod, but that's a dragonfly in the middle of the winter. He's just hanging out there, not moving very fast. Okay, next slide. And there's more. It just keeps on going. There's a. Uh, um, I think that's Pinterest right there, but there's a, is it Pinterest? Does that, does that look familiar to anyone? Or I, maybe it's iNaturalist, but there's a, I think it's iNaturalist. There's a page out there on one of those two. Uh, that's Pinterest? Right there on the screen, okay. yes, whether or not you have an iNaturalist. Okay, so I know there's an iNaturalist Pro, MD Anderson project out there. I haven't really looked at it much, but uh, this is Pinterest, and this is from uh, the Katy Prairie Conservancy. And they just started collecting observed insects, and there's quite a bit. It's, there's quite a bit of diversity out there. It's fascinating. Some, some of these things are really beautiful, and, uh, beautiful. and where do they come from? We didn't order them on Amazon. They, they just showed up because of the prairie. It's really neat. So the prairies brought an explosion of life. Slide. And uh, so I like to share this. You know, wildlife diversity is an indicator of a healthy ecosystem. 
healthy ecosystems are safe for people. That means we're not using, that's a good indicator that we're not using these endocrine disrupting chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides. Uh, so you can see how we're starting to tie back the ecosystem health with our own health, okay? Um, and in, this is neat from a hospital perspective. Viewing wildlife is linked to increased compassion and improved relationships. That's one of the, the facts from, or one of the results of a, um, a study uh, similar to what Dr. Ulrich did with uh, the, the um, post-operative recovery slide. Wildlife exists underground too. We, we, we consider our microbes, our soil biology, our nematodes, uh, our microarthropods, we consider that wildlife as well. It's the basis of the food chain. So when you're using these toxic chemicals, fungicides especially, you're, you're zapping that. You're resetting uh, the button, starting succession all over again, um, you know, really damaging your soil. You know, healthy soil, healthy plants, uh, and, and people too. There's a lot of research about gut biomes and how that right out of MD Anderson, as a matter of fact, how your gut biome, uh, which uh, is often inoculated through soil contact, um, can and does serve as your first wave of immunity against diseases. Slide. Educational venue. The prairies are also educational venues. It's another benefit. If you guys build a prairie and you're not using it for education, you have a weed patch. You have a weed patch, and that's how people are going to interpret it unless you get out in front of them and talk about it. So this is a group of uh, facilities, uh, people, and there's some doctors. You guys uh, know Christine Mansfield? Uh, that's Dr. Mansfield right there, her, uh, her father. Okay, slide. And, you know, we had... Um, we needed coaching on this because we didn't really know how to connect with people on the prairie. So uh, Jaime and, and Christine with the Katy Prairie Conservancy came out and taught us how to do that. So here we have staff throwing seed balls. So if you guys do your own prairie, this is what you do. You make seed balls and you get people to throw it, throw them. And, uh, you know, it really is great. It breaks down barriers. All of a sudden people are talking to each other and, and uh, shaking hands and laughing. And it's just a lot of fun. It's a great way to create ownership, too. All of a sudden, um, you know, that's my prairie. I, I planted, I threw some seed balls out there. That's mine. Slide. And interpretive signage, that's another way to um, have the educational component when you're not there. If you don't have a sign in your sustainable landscape projects, prairies, whatever it is, then uh, you're missing an opportunity because the sign does what you can't do, or the sign does what you do when you're not there, even when you're sleeping, okay? Slide. Research and observation. This is an un unintended benefit of the prairie, but it really opened the doors for community collaboration. Um, Kelly has done a lot of stuff out there and other, other researchers. Um, and they've looked at everything from insect diversity, native bee diversity, rodents. Uh, they, there are people looking at the soil biology, comparing the bacteria in a restored site to other prairie restorations around the city. Um, so some interesting facts that we learned. Uh, we, the pra at, at this time, the prairie had been established for about two years, but already we had 30 species of orthopterans. These are kickets, kickets, crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers. Okay, there were 37 species of native bees observed, and uh, that's fascinating. That is a that's a huge number, and they just again, where do they come from? We don't know. <laughs> you build it, and they they will come. What that does tell me about the native bees, a lot of these, uh, I learned from uh, Danielle Below, who, who moved, unfortunately, she's in Denver now, but I, she did a lot of work on, on uh, native bees and trying to work with public works departments in the city to inc incorporate native bee habitats into parking lots because she learned that native bees have a limited flight radius. There's, there's small, medium, large bees. Each bee has a, a certain radius, right? And... Uh, um, if they don't have a connecting prairie, pat, prairie patch or food source, well, they can't ever leave their little bubble. And then they'll eventually die because that little bubble, the, whatever pollinating plant or whatever food source they have in there, will eventually go away somehow. So what this tells me, let me go back.
back up. So her work was to overlay the flight paths of native bees uh, centered on prairie patches and try to create connectivity so that they could fly and migrate across the city and have that uh, diversity that they were missing. So what this tells me by having our native bees show up is that somewhere nearby we have a suitable habitat and we're providing an extra layer of connectivity. Okay, slide. I just thought of that, by the way. Okay, restorative destination number seven. Uh, we've talked about this. Um, nature is a restorative place. Whether you're here in the middle of a state park or at MD Anderson, looking at it from your your um, hotel or your hotel, your um, hospital room. So some of the rooms are very hotel-like as part of the environmental psychology. So we know already interacting with nature, simply observing it for minutes reduces stress, muscle attention and anxiety. It provides a positive distraction from the burdens of care and treatment, whether you're at St. Luke's or Methodist or MD Anderson. It also encourages physical activity. That's very important from a uh, public health perspective. So at MD Anderson, patients are highly mobile. They'll take their IV poles and they'll wander around in the evenings and walk. Walking is great. Slide. Okay, so I told you that the prairie kind of created its own momentum and spurred a lot of other good things. So I'm going to talk about some of those. Slide. All right, so we talked about prairies, how they're not flat, right? They have these depressions, okay, called potholes. So we wanted to, we, we wondered, what if? What if we recreated two potholes out on our prairie? So that's what we did. And uh, kind of doodled a little sketch there and, and uh, um, started talking about it. And next slide and found a location. So this is in the winter time after we mow. We mow one time a year versus 43 times a year. Okay. You, now you will recall, recall that this used to be a parking lot for the HMB building. So we left the storm drains there. We didn't bother removing them. And that storm drain now is part of our uh, pothole system. So we, we decided to put a pothole on each side of the storm drain and they would overflow uh, into the storm drain. Okay, slide. So there we go, we started to mark it out and excavate. We dug 12 inches of beautiful soil out, put a liner down, and then put the soil back. It was really that simple. Of course, we had, had to make sure that it was level and would hold water, but we decided to use a liner because we wanted to retain the water as long as possible once we had it filled up. Otherwise, they would evaporate just like that, being as shallow as they are. Um, next slide. Okay, so there you go, uh, as we're, we're kind of testing it out there to see if everything works. You see the storm drain in the middle of the, of the yellow flag, so they overflow. In fact, this one on the bottom of the side, you can see it overflowing on the top there. Okay, slide. Even before we had plants out there, just by having water, we had signs of wildlife activity. It was really cool. So um, that's probably a great egret on the left, and that, I don't know, what does that look like, a possum or a raccoon maybe? Something. <laughs> Mountain lion, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Okay, slide. And there you go, that, that's uh, shortly after Filling it up one time, planting. The plants uh, came from the, a, um, a roadside ditch behind our office. We learned to identify wetland species, went out there. We did have a couple donated to us. Uh, land came out and brought a bunch as well. And uh, next slide. There's just a different angle, so there's two of them. We brought uh, gambusia, mosquito eating fish in there to control mosquito populations. And what else? Slide, a little observation platform, okay? And now, you know, they're starting to disappear. You, you can't hardly see them in this slide unless you go up to that observation platform. And here's a little more uh, mature picture. This is uh, last fall, I believe. I can see the goldenrod blooming. And I mean, that to me, that's beautiful. I know beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but uh, that's really neat. And it's so great to see a patient wandering around, having no idea what's out there, and then all of a sudden, oh, looking at this pothole. <laughs> Whether they like it or not, it's a positive distraction from what's going on in the hospital and that's all we want really. Next slide. 
and there's another picture there. I mean, it's really neat to see how these things integrate and blend and just kind of melt away into, into the surrounding landscape. Slide? There's a different angle there. So what do you see there? A sign. Got to have the sign. Otherwise, that's just a mosquito breeding habitat. Next slide. But our, slide, our sign tells a different story. Okay. I know, you, I know you guys can't read that, but that's okay. Next slide. Stormwater wetlands. So the next evolution of the prairie was to um, was to build stormwater wetlands. So the, the prairie potholes are kind of a passive wetland system. They belong in the prairie, um, but. A true, a true prairie pothole on, an, on these old prairies once served as giant pre-filters. All these, all these prairies and the potholes uh, served as giant pre-filters for water, fresh water, flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. We don't have that anymore. Um, but we can recreate it on a very small scale with a stormwater wetland. A stormwater wetland is different from a pothole because you have moving water, you have a source where the water comes in, an inflow, and you have an outflow where the water leaves and enters into the watershed. The theory is that moving the water through all the organic matter in the plants will improve the water quality by the time it leaves the system. Okay, but look down there in the lower right, caring for our environment. MD Anderson is committed to sound environmental stewardship and this stormwater wetland is part of a wider initiative to provide healthy and sustainable green spaces, not only for the environment, but for our patients, visitors, and staff. Does that sound familiar? That's, that's the why behind why we do these things that I talked about, that I spent so much time on in the beginning because it's very fundamental and really drives what we do at MD Anderson. Next slide. Okay, so here's what a stormwater wetland looks like. Um, we, we first have to start with a detention pond. So this could be a detention pond at your community center, at a church, uh, if you want to go large scale and pick out a neighborhood detention pond that's you know five or six acres, you know, there's a great opportunity there. We started small. Okay, so uh, next slide. We had to, can you back up slides? Okay, so the inflow and the outflow have to be on opposite ends of the system. So next slide. We had to move one, so we moved it. Next slide. And there, there, so now in the background you see, well in the foreground this is where the water comes in and it flows kind of in a circle and it does a 180 and it goes back out that far end. Slide. And there you go. Um, that's the exit. So now you see that this detention pond has been kind of carved and sculpted a little bit. Next slide. We put a weir in there. It's a dam. Okay, so that dam holds water in temporarily. A detention pond is its purpose is to hold water, is to hold runoff. <coughs> Excuse me. Temporarily, um, while um, instead of inundating our waterways with flood water, it's to serve. It's to hold the water temporarily and just let other you know let the creeks go down before releasing this. So the weir holds the water a little bit longer. Otherwise, that would just flow right out, and it, it gives us different depths that were um, we used a, a level laser level and we did some hand grading, and then we planted it. So it's you know it's not very beautiful in that picture, but uh, next slide. It doesn't take long for this stuff to really take off. And to me, that is absolutely stunning. This was just a, a silly detention pond on the side of a building, and now it's a beautiful place that people are interested in. These are native plants. These, there are prairie grasses in here. There's switchgrass and blue stem grass in here. This is nothing more than a giant prairie pothole functioning the way that they should. Okay. Um, you know, and we 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 are very happy with this project, and we do try to uh, manage its aesthetics a little bit by uh, thinning some of the plants that become invasive. There's some ornamental plants on the margins. Next slide. There's another shot there. Next slide. There's the weir functioning. So you see uh, how the water kind of flows over. Next slide. Thalia, the the broadleaf plant that looks like a ginger. Next slide. Ah, and this, 
This is exactly what we wanted to see. So we're creating a refuge for um, native plants, a refuge for urban wildlife. It's a place where people want to go. Uh, there's other benefits. We're avoiding the cost of, of mowing in that, in that grass-lined detention pond. Uh, we're improving stormwater quality. Uh, as the water leaves that site, it's, it's in better condition than when it entered. And um, it's just these are just such great projects. It's a win-win for people and nature. Next slide. And this is just uh, two weeks ago. Went back and well, actually, I didn't take this picture. I had someone grab that. Mary Carol Edwards took this picture. She's the she is a program coordinator with the Texas Coastal Watershed Program. So if you guys have a project like this that you want to get started or need some help with, that's where you go. Uh, the Texas Coastal Watershed Program. It's actually part of Texas AgriLife Extension Service, and they do have funding uh, to help get your projects going. They were able to give us um, uh, $15,000, if I recall correctly, uh, for two stormwater wetlands. So there's a second one. Unfortunately, it was no sooner than we built it, it was reclaimed for mobile MRI, MRI units and uh, due to a, a, a relatively high priority project. So it went away. But next slide. We're doing it again. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when it's just starting. So this is also on South Campus. We lost an acre or more of prairie to a new parking lot. Anytime you have an impervious surface uh, or building addition like a parking lot in uh, Houston, you have to have a stormwater. Uh, you have to you have to have a either a detention pond to manage that stormwater or some other measure. I don't know all the all the uh, rules behind that. We want stormwater wetlands, so we're going to opt for the surface detention pond like this. And in time, if you can go back one more slide. It will look like this. So uh, that hole was dug just before I left, <laughs> and I'm, I'm confident I've left confident. I'm, I'm confident I've left good people in in charge of that uh, project. So I saw a question in the hand. How, how old is that project? Not this one. The previous one. That's about that's about two years, right there. Two years. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this is the wetland Y. Uh, we've we've been talking about this. It, uh, it really is synonymous with um, with prairies because wetlands and prairies go together. They advance sustainability initiatives for our institution and for for you. Uh, it connects people to nature. We are increasing the biodiversity of plants and animals. We're conserving water, reducing maintenance, and you know, from an institutional perspective, um, it provides a, it provides positive PR. You know, a lot of times people ask, well, how can I get my leaders or my neighborhood association to do this? Well, sell them on the marketing benefits. You know, everyone wants to support the environment, but people don't really know how, or they don't know ways that make sense. You know, you've got to appeal to a broad spectrum of interests, political, you know, alignment, and, and um, you know, people can get behind health benefits of nature. They can get behind uh, economic benefits of nature. Uh, the environmental benefits might be a tougher sell, depending sell depending on who you're talking to. But uh, there's something in it for everybody. Next slide. Okay, so. In the, so the future of nature at MD Anderson looks good. You know, we've got these prog programs built. We've got a, uh, we've changed the landscape over there. We have uh, new uh, sustainability initiatives like stormwater wetlands. We know, we understand what a restorative uh, hospital garden looks like. So before I left, I made sure that I captured all of this, the, the seven years of my work there and wrote as much as possible into our owner design guidelines so that next time there's a new building and those architects and engineers get those plans or the, the initial specifications, the guidelines that tell you what what to do with a site, well they're going to see patient care gardens with the, all of these restorative characteristics. They're going to see stormwater wetlands in lieu of detention ponds. They're going to see native plants. They're going to see uh, native ecosystems. It's, we're hoping that we can get at least, if, for every new site that we have, we're hoping to get at least some sort of uh, native ecosystem restored on there, whether it's a pocket prairie in the Gulf Coast, if it's up in the woodlands or Kingwood, north, you know, the East Piney 
woods uh, that you know we'll see a, a reforestation project on the site. So that's uh, hopefully the legacy that I've 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 left. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, next slide. And I'll kind of end it with this. This is Flo Hanna's grandson uh, getting lost in the prairie. You know, that's that's great. And it's a good age and, and to be, and and uh, you you can only wonder what he's thinking as he goes down that little trail there. His imagination is probably running wild, but uh, this is this is this kind of sums up uh, why we do what we do. So, questions. Is the older design guidelines only for MD Anderson, or does it apply to any buildings? Just MD Anderson. Mm -hmm. Plan. So who is there now, and is that person going to continue the stormwater wetlands and the prairies and things like that until they build a building over there? Yes, so uh, I came from a very small work unit. There's there's just a handful of us. We're very close, and, um, and we are all in alignment. So my former boss is the chief engineer. Um, we have a wonderful new person, Iris Clausen Davis, who has assumed a lot of my responsibilities. She's coming to us from the Dallas Arboretum. She's got a lot of background in this as well. Uh, she's a horticulturist in addition. Um, so she is full steam ahead. Uh, some of you know my colleague Alan Wolf, uh, same thing, full steam ahead. So we have the people and resources at, at MD Anderson to make this, to keep this alive and keep it going. Yes. Uh, question in the back. Well, I think Lon knows what I know, and that is, we thought the prairie was temporary because of the, uh, a building will be built there. Yes, that's a good question. So I, I showed a, a rendering slide. That's from our long-term capital plan that showed four buildings. So the two buildings in the bottom of the picture sit on the prairie. Uh, this one specifically is right in the middle of the prairie. And, you know, we knew this going into it, um, and that's okay. You know, we're gonna we're gonna continue with prairies elsewhere on campus, and there will be prairie grasses integrated into this. Uh, one of the outcomes of doing this is uh, in 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 working these into the owner design guidelines is that we integrate nature into the fabric of MD Anderson, not just with patient care, uh, in in employee health and wellness, um, but facilities design. Going back all the way to the beginning with Dr. Roger Ulrich, who was a pioneer of evidence-based design for healthcare settings. He looked at how the environment influenced outcomes, clinical outcomes, but he also worked on actual hospital design. Um, everything from OR room uh, or surgical room ergonomics to what does the main lobby look like, uh, making it look more like a hotel. Come to find out, Dr. Ulrich did in fact have a um, have some input on the on the original design of May's clinic to the on the top of the slide in the Duncan Cancer Prevention Building on the uh, right hand side. So these other two buildings will continue that design theme. Um, so that's that was a great um, that was a great bit of news that I learned recently that he he had a, some influence on this. But we intend to preserve as much as we can with this with these new buildings. Okay. Question. Are you going to surreptitiously put in some native plants back there in the Mark Formal Garden, despite uh, their plans not to or whatever? So I don't have as much latitude with garden design out here because we have people directly responsible for that. We also have a master plan that um, that uh, we have to honor and respect. So there are going to be little uh, ecological wins here and there. Um, I can tell you that the garden staff out here does a wonderful job at uh, avoiding chemicals and pesticides. It's 100% organic, far more organic and biological based than, um, than I practice at MD Anderson. They practice uh, what I say true, or what I call true horticulture out here. Can you, um, I mean, do they have 
Okay, uh, can you sneak some native plants in? <laughs> <laughs> so, be outside. Okay, do you decide, can you uh, be part of the decision making on what plants they put in? We, we can. There's a process. We would, uh, we would run through the process and, and make collaborative decisions. Now, outside of the McGovern Gardens, in, the, in Herman Park proper, there are prairie restoration sites. There's the Whistletop Prairie. There's a small prairie on, um, underneath the uh, Post Oak Savannas on... Um, Almeda. It's not very visible. The Whistletop Prairie is visible. It's very nice. It's it's not as large as what we saw just now. Um, and there, that that is a pollinator habitat. That's an opportunity for um, native plants. We also have a lot of property along the bayou as well. Um, Shoring up the the uh, slopes with wildflowers, and native grasses. That's that's on our radar as well. So, yes. Question. This is kind of tangential, but before she left, did Danielle Biafrio have any headway with the Houston City Council on on uh, the plants that went around the parking lot? I'm not sure. Because that was, it was the a, rest of her presentation last fall at yeah. the People in West Prairie's yeah. conference was, was trying to get the plantings around parking lots mm -hmm. changed to support yeah, I promise to carry the torch, <laughs> not necessarily with the city, but where I where I can make a difference. I know where she's at in Denver. She's she's made a lot of progress with that also. So, any other questions? What's the ne next prairie project? I don't know. That would be a good question for Lan. You might know all the prairie projects happening. No. no. Okay. But uh, you know, I can say that. Every local institution has been out to look at this one, and I'd like I'd like to think that this has validated others' um, intent to create their own prairies. So Rice has been out, St. Thomas, U of H. Uh, can you think of any others? HCC. Houston Community College, right? Okay, we've had uh, a biology professor come out with the class, and look around. Um, so it's been it's been it's been a great um, jumping uh, or great platform to jump from in order to spread prairies around the Houston area. Actually, um, the uh, Houston Park and Recreation uh, under Jed Aplaca and uh, ah. they're putting in a lot of uh, yes. prairie and native plants yes. in different areas. They Thank you. Recently planted this area near Clinton. Clinton uh -huh. Park or something like that. You're right. Clinton Park, and that's then they are working closely with the um, the Fish and Wildlife Service with that um, outreach program that I was telling you about earlier. Yeah. What is the easiest access to the prairie? The particular street. That the best thing to do is park in TMC Garage Number Two, Texas Medical Center Garage Number Two, and then just walk down Holcomb. That's Holcomb right there in, into the prairie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's on the southeast corner of Holcomb and Fannin. Southeast corner. Southeast mm -hmm. corner of Holcomb. Holcomb and Fannin. Okay. okay. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Oh, he also has business cards.